Thanks everyone with patience. Um, so don't want to delay any more. So I'll introduce Harsha Gunawardena, um, who is a senior scientist mass spectrometry at uh, Jensen Pharmaceuticals. Um, he'll be speaking about uh, autonomous pipeline for characterization of biotherapeutics, integrating rapid analytics with rapid informatics. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, good morning and welcome. And um, I would like to first thank the organizers for inviting me once again this year to present. And today I'll be describing the pipeline which integrates rapid analytics with rapid informatics. So to give you an outline of my talk, first I'll go over high throughput characterization in a pharmaceutical R&D setting and show you what high throughput offers for pharmaceutical research. My talk will be two parts. The first part, I will introduce you to some methods that will perform rapid analysis using droplet chemistry as well as instrumentation that can rapidly introduce samples into a mass spectrometer to collect high throughput data. In the second part, I will go over the informatic strategies that will enable us to detect these uh, acquisitions very rapidly, uh, also perform uh, low-level gly glycoform quantitation using the rapid fireMS data, as well as how we've made improvements in the algorithms to look at low-level glycoforms in these data sets, conclusions and future directions. So as you all know, monoclonal antibodies have been for a while. They've been there for about 35 years and uh, perhaps there's about 1,000 programs that are currently in pro ongoing for monoclonal antibodies with over 100 monoclonal antibodies that are already commercialized. But we are currently moving away from these monoclonal antibodies to these multi-specific modalities. And in these modalities, we're actually harnessing the power of the immune system to target cancer. So one half of this multi-specific antibody the cancer antigen and the other half binds to an antigen present on the immune cells. So this type of modality presents many problems. And they're listed here is that once we clone them into single cells, they are prone to aggregation. There are certain domains on these antibodies that clump up together and this aggregation is a quality attribute that we monitor. Another important attribute is this chain mispairing and of course uh, importantly, there is also degradation of the antibody because of the unusual sequences. Just to give you an outline of the drug discovery and development process, once targets are declared, the entire portfolio, and in discovery, we make hundreds, if not thousands, of candidates, potential molecules that go through lead, lead selection, lead, uh, lead generation, lead selection, and enter cell line development, which we are part of. So as you can see, the number of molecules start very big, thousands, end up to single digit. And there's a triaging process where in which we need to select the best molecules that enter cell line development. Once they're in cell line development, there's also another triaging process where we can narrow down the number of colonies from about a thousand to a single colony that will ends up becoming a lead clone that goes into late phase development. So I can see both in the, in the standpoint of molecules as well as the number of colonies, analytical cannot be the bottleneck. So we have to introduce high throughput methods to de-bottleneck de these uh, processes. So how do we do this? And in our group, we've introduced high throughput automation. The setup that you're seeing on the left-hand side is automated sample preparation coupled with mass spectrometry. In this setup, we are using a liquid handler to introduce samples on a rail directly into the mass spectrometers. And these are high resolution mass spectrometers. And once the data is collected, they're stored in internal servers for two types of assays, peptide mapping as well as intact data. I'm generalizing these for now and I'll go into the specifics. Once the data is collected, a watcher looks at these data and automatically sweeps into an automation module, which is called the biosphere. And all the data is processed on the Amazon workspace on the cloud. So once the data is processed, they can be aggregated in gene data or within Biosphere, which is a repository for all the data that we are collecting across the enterprise, share with customers within the company across different organizations, as well as there is a client that can examine reports and the reports, reporting of the data is completely automated. So how do we improve uh, sample preparation? One, 
way in which we can improve sample preparation is to perform these uh, micro droplet reactions to characterize antibody. This is pretty new, and we've collaborated with academic groups to facilitate these accelerated reactions in droplets. So in typical uh, mass spectrometry experiment, we're introducing uh, samples through electrospray. And in this case, we are producing finer droplets of these electrospray uh, molecules. So if we can mix the antibody with uh, enzyme of interest, and we can perform these micro droplet reactions in roughly about four seconds through uh, mixing in, in this uh, T junction. So it only takes about four seconds for samples to be mixed. In the second example below, you can see that we can use two streams where one stream is introducing the antibody and the second stream is introducing the enzyme. And through a droplet fusion zone, the droplets get fused and that facilitates these reactions to happen in nearly 250 microseconds. So we've used this technology to uh, characterize antibodies and here I'm showing the digestion of an antibody into a FAB and a single chain FC using IDGE, which is an enzyme that cleaves at a single point on the antibody. And typically this can be done in about 30 minutes to about an hour. And given that we can perform this in nearly 250 microseconds, this is about a 7.5 million fold increase in speed. So it's super fast, and that allows us to automate this. So how have you automated this process is to introduce the samples using an auto sampler. So the auto sampler allows you to draw the antibody, draw the enzyme, mix them in an empty well, and then get it to the flow path where an isocratic run of uh, neutral buffer allows the sample to be carried to the source where it's ionized. So every injection takes place in two minutes and that's the rate limiting step, but the reaction happens here in 20 microseconds. So what you're seeing is the first five runs, which are reactions, and the sixth run is just the infusion of the antibody. So we get high quality data, average conversion of the reaction to the products or the subunits is about 90% with high reproducibility with the coefficient of variation about 2%, which is very good. I would say it's remarkable. So this is uh, a close up of what you saw here, which is the IDES digestion of the antibody to produce the FAB prime 2, which is kind of the business end of the molecule, which binds to the antigens. In addition to that, we form the FC and because we are running native pH conditions, we are seeing dimerization. And this was a, a surprise to us. So we take this FAB prime 2 and what we can do is we can examine various types of post-translational modifications on the fly. So you can infuse this in two minutes, you can get the spectra, and then we can further fragment the molecule in the gas phase to look at where, post -post where these post-translational modifications are happening. So in the first uh, spectrum you can see is we are using the second enzyme, which is IDGE, that cleaves above the uh, uh, the disulfides on the hinge to produce the FAB and the FC. And in the spectrum there, we can see is that you can get sequence ions that can localize uh, putative modifications. The bottom is an analysis we've done where we stressed uh, the antibody with glucose. So the glycated antibody FAB domain is then subjected to MSMS, and then we can localize where the sugar is actually uh, modifying, and in this case, we identified the sugar residue to be localized heavily on a lysine on the CDR. So in addition to looking at post-translational modifications, where does this really help us is in binding studies. So we've recently moved and examined the possibility of using micro droplet digestions to look at antigen-antibody interactions. So in this case, you can see as we load the number of RSVF uh, antigens you can see that the spectrum becomes very complicated due to the heterogeneity of the glycans, as well as adjacent overlapping of the adjacent uh, charge states of the unmodified form with the RSVF bound forms. So in order to circumvent these issues, the best strategy that we feel is to perform this AIDS micro droplet digestion. So you can see the signal is suppressed because of the free RSVF antigen. And at the bottom, you can see the deconvoluted spectrum with uh, multiple glycoforms as well as the bound and the unbound forms. But if you perform these micro droplet digestions, you can clearly see that these bound forms can be clearly resolved with no gly glycosylation attached to the signal. 
So automated data analysis pipeline. So we are using a rapid fire MS workflow for characterizing biotherapeutics. And this is giving you a, a complete view of what the automation looks like. So you can see we start with the limb system, which registers the molecules, and we can pick them up to this automation module, which is two, which prepares the samples using robotics. And in this case, once the robotic sample preparation is complete, this system is not completely integrated with rapid fire currently. So we are envisioning that a mobile robot can carry the samples to the rapid fire and perform the uh, rapid injections. Once the data is collected, there are four work streams as listed here on the data server number four, where we have intact mass, deglycosylated mass, reduced mass, and subunit mass analysis. So there are four different work streams which have built-in workflows in the biosphere module that can pull the data based on the type of uh, analysis you perform on the rapid fire, process everything on the cloud and report it uh, to, to the stakeholders. We can also aggregate the data within uh, the biosphere as well as gene data, which then completes the cycle because the limbs has uh, a way to uh, tap into the data within gene data. So it's a complete end-to-end -end, uh, workflow where we can do these types of analysis. So what does the rapid fire do? I can just show you like uh, how the injection cycle works. So we have three valves. Actually, the fourth valve is the vacuum valve. Right behind this, you can't see. And then the sample plates put on the platform. And then onto the bottom left-hand side of this picture, you see the cartridges. So. It's an intricate movement of valves. So in the first step, we aspirate the sample into the loop using a vacuum. And once the SIP sense senses the liquid, it changes the position of the valve to load the sample into the cartridge. So now pump one is an aqueous uh, solvent that pushes the sample that's on the loop onto the cartridge. While that's happening, pump three is put pushing liquid through, um, which is organic, into the mass spectrometer. And then we can do additional washers using pump two, where that pump two solvent becomes in line with the cartridge to do additional washers to get rid of salt, any, any type of uh, salts. And then finally, we elute the trapped protein using high organic from pump three into the mass spectrometer. And we pretty much complete the cycle where the sample gets analyzed by the mass spectrometer. And then the final step is to re-equilibrate uh, the cartridge for the second injection. So all this takes place in 12 to 25 seconds, depending on how you segment these different uh, uh, parts. We can also perform this really quickly, which is called rapid fire blaze mode, where we can do the injection bypassing valve three, valve two, and the cartridge directly onto the mass spectrometer. And that takes about two seconds. Here is uh, just a, a workflow from discovery all the way through cell line development. There are uh, different stages where we can use rapid fire. So in discovery, what we want is to evaluate the broad transfection pools to see whether we can get the optimum molecule that goes into cell line development. And in cell line development, there is uh, a stage which is called the 96 default stage where we can pick the best clones and triage clones, the top 25, 24 clones that go into the bioreactors. So again, the, the data acquisition happens really fast. 96 samples in 20 minutes. I want you to remember the number. And then uh, all the data is automatically swept and the analysis is completed in 30 minutes. So the entire workflow from acquisition to reporting is under one hour. And what you see on the right-hand side is further processing of the data on the heat map, which can uh, be done outside of, of this workflow. So to give you more details on how we can look at chain mispairing is we can transfer different ratios of these chains in the bispecific process where we can transfer them to chores, XP chores, or any type of cell line. And then we look for the desired heterodimer, but most often we don't get the, de we get the desired homodimer along with this undesired uh, homodimeric species, sometimes both homodimers or just one homodimer half mass, fragments, aggregates, and so on. But in this case, we want to show how rapid fire can be used to look at ratios between homodimer and heterodimer. We can see that on the bottom spectrum is the raw spectrum. We can see the homodimer to a, as low as 10%, all the way up to 50%. So 
there's a linear response uh, and it's pretty much good to quantify anything about 10% all the way to 50%. So how do we use this in cellulite development is that we don't have many molecules now. We have a single molecule that's transfected into a host Cho cell, host cell which is a Cho. And then once we expand the cells into number of colonies in the 96 deep well stage or the 24 deep well stage, not only do we look for high producing cells based on the titer, we also look for product quality. In this case, again, looking for chain misparing and looking for the possibility of seeing these homodimers, halfmers, aggregates, and so on. So this can be done really fast. And what I'm showing here is a case study where we looked at the 96 deep well plates uh, for product quality. So in this example, what we found out is the table on the right-hand side showed that the highest producing titers, third, only 13% of the highest producing titer, uh, titer clones move forward due to product quality issues. So not, we can't just consider the titer alone. We, we have to look into these product quality issues early on. Informatics. So I will go through some of the strategies that we've taken to improve the informatics in order to look at these high throughput data. So here what you're saying is 96 well, uh, well plate analyzed in 20 minutes. So each of these spikes that you see here is an acquisition. And this happens in 20 minutes. So the x-axis is time. And what we can do is process each of these spikes. And what you see is a raw file. And then you can deconvolute the data and obtain like form information. So this is intact mass measurements of the glycoforms. So in this analysis, we had 10 different plates, so 960 spots analyzed in three and a half hours with a failure rate of about 0.4% and a CV of under 1%. So it's highly reproducible with limited touch time. We can get very high volume data analyzed uh, quite successfully for glycoforms. Now, how do you further improve this glycoform analysis is a strategy that we have adopted from uh, various other research groups is to use this uh, reagent that can do proton capture, proton transfer. So we are stripping protons from this uh, antibody to reduce the charge. So the advantage of doing this is we can improve the, uh, the specificity or the resolution of the glycoforms that are being um, not being resolved when you just directly infuse them. So you can see that throughout this rapid fire run, we can gradually reduce the charge and improve the glycoform resolution. So this can definitely enhance the quality of the data that we get uh, in our analysis. So moving from intax, how about complexes? So we've done this work with the rapid fire blaze mode where we can directly introduce the sample into the mass spectrometer uh, you, under native pH conditions. So we don't have all the steps that I showed here. We have two steps, which is aspirate and load. And once we load that, we can see this multi-specific ionizers with the various types of complexes. So we can see the dimer and all the way to the trimer of this uh, bispecific antibody. The informatic strategies right now uh, that's available for this type of analysis uh, is shown in this uh, in this diagram where we have the 96 well plate that's mapped and what we produce is a mega file which is called sequence one and there is automated uh, uh, script that split the, splits the file into smaller files which are then used for the analysis. So how do we associate molecular information to allow biosphere to process them independently is using this meta file, metadata file that's shown on the bottom. So, that encodes all the molecular information, may it be different uh, colonies or may it be different uh, molecules with different sequences. That information is also stripped into this automation module. And the molecular information also has whether the analysis was done under reduced conditions or whether they were done under native intact uh, masses of these antibodies. The diagram to your right, you see gene data which registers these molecules and not only does it assemble the molecule to its target protein, it can also look for potential impurities where it automatically mispairs and does all the permutations to get all these permutated masses of these chains. And a Python script automatically moves this information into the automation module to match any particular mass that we identify through this analysis. So again, this all takes under one minute. The entire informatics uh, uh, pipeline and the infrastructure allows you to do this with no human intervention. 
So reporting, how do we see the data is, is a customizable web-based reports that can be uh, pulled from the cloud using a web client. And what you're seeing is relative glycan distributions that you see for the analysis as well as mass accuracy. So we can really capture if you're looking at the correct mispaired chains because of the accuracy in which they're assigned. And in addition to this, we can see raw data uh, as plots, which I have not shown here, and their corresponding deconvoluted spectra. Another feature of this pipeline is we can do advanced querying capabilities using metadata attributes. So this is very much useful because we have about 15 different instruments in our lab, and depending on where the analysis happen, it's very difficult to trace it. So we can search them by instrument, we can search them by molecule, we can search uh, data that's on the cloud using other attributes such as um, uh, the stage in which it was analyzed, and also compare the same molecule uh, uh, probably using different constructs across different programs. So these uh, search capabilities tremendously help us to you know, keep a track of the data and also uh, further analyze data uh, holistically. So uh, next I would like to show you some of the analysis we've done with glycoforms and how we've used uh, reduced mass to look at the heavy chain like glycosylation as well as how we are using subunits to look, examine glycosylation. So here we compare uh, rapid fire MS with LCMS. So you can see this analysis on the left took 12 seconds and on the right, the same molecule took 15 minutes. The data quality is very much comparable and we can get all the low level glycoforms such as MAN5 and, and anything that's very close to the baseline quite efficiently even with rapid fire data. So we didn't stop there. We looked at a number of different molecules and col different colonies within each molecule. Look for low-level glycoforms such as MAN5. And in this case, you can see maps 1, 3, and 4 have MAN5 levels that are pretty much trending the same way. And for the three maps that had MAN5, the correlation is quite strong. And in certain maps, you don't have MAN5. And in other maps, we also have a few correlation. And so that's shown in map 4. So how does this algorithm perform with industry standard algorithms such as max and one from Waters is that we found that the man five levels quantified across 50 different colonies showed statistically insignificant changes. May, may, may be you look at the man five in both chains as average or whether you look at man five levels in individual chains. So the correlation is extremely uh, good and sufficient to uh, believe in some of the uh, data that's been processed through this pipeline uh, uh, algorithm, which is a parsimonious algorithm. Subunit analysis. So how do we look at subunits? Is you can use the IDES digestion now in solution to produce the Fab Prime 2, and then you use a reducing agent to create these uh, fragments. So you deconvolute the data, and you can see the single chain FC, the FD. And then when you look closely at the single chain FC, we can see additional glycosylation that we never saw for the light chain. In this case, we see glycosylation in all three chains uh, using this rapid fire data. So what I want to illustrate here is not only are we doing high throughput analysis, we are also doing high throughput informatics. So in A, if you do LC, it takes eight hours. And if you do rapid fire MS, you can shorten the time, but the analysis is long. But if you combine automation, it is uh, done in less than one hour. So finally, I would like to close this talk because we are slightly running over time is to see how we've improved on the algorithms. And here we are showing is a process in which we use charge envelope filtering. The forward mapping is traditionally used to map masses to mass charges where you have direct control of the charge state distribution in electrospheric data. Protein matrix have taken another approach is to do backward mapping where you take the mass to charges and map masses. And this helps you to include isotope spacings as well as other delta masses, which we call local peak attributes. And there's a weighting function which we can use to improve this, uh, the quality of the MOZ spectrum. And that really helps us to look at low level species. And what we've seen here for MAN5 is when we use the charge envelope filtering, uh, we can pretty much get quantitation comparable to the release glycan reference standard that we run for the same samples. 
So we further extended these techniques with stabilized stop labeling and looking at quantitation and comparing across rapid fire and LCMS and looking for ratios that we observe with target ratios. And what we find here is a way to calibrate the data quite efficiently and examine uh, ways in which we can uh, assign true quantitative values to our data. So since I'm running really short of time, I would like to make the conclusions by saying micro droplet reactions, ultra fast digestions really help in rapid characterization of multi attributed antibodies. Rapid fire has allowed us to do this analysis for high volume operations in our, in our, uh, in our pipeline. And Biosphere is a platform in which we can automatically export results, aggregate data, uh, and provides advanced querying capabilities. And the key is the analysis is fully automated and we can monitor quality attributes, 96 samples in 10 minutes. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge folks at Janssen, our collaborators, and thank you once again for your patience and attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Arjan. Um, we have a few a few minutes, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, again, come up to the mic. Um, if not, I do have one question. Sure. Um, due to you, uh, your technique pushing the high throughput nature, um, one of the things that crossed my mind was, uh, was there any potential for cross-contamination as you're injecting multiple samples in very short intervals, e either in the electrospray chamber or in the auto sampler. Um, if there was any sort of initial indication of that, maybe what steps were taken to ensure that? Yeah, sure. Occurred. That's a good question. So we did look at rapid fire because it uh, has uh, the same sipper sipping multiple samples very rapidly. Uh, we looked at and evaluated carryover and we see very minimal carryover to make a difference in the deconvolution. We also injected blanks in between to look for carryover. And when we do that, you know, the carryover is all almost non-existent. So yeah, we did. Very nice talk. <clears throat> Thank you. So quick question, sorry if I, I apologize if I missed this, but you mentioned the 96 samples in 20 minutes. Is that with one of those workflows? You talked about four different work streams. Pretty much every workflow can be done in the same at the same speed. So uh, sample preparation happens outside of the rapid fire. So whether you process one sample or whether you process a thousand samples, uh, the speed in which you analyze is the same. Yeah. Right. There's uh, one more. Yeah, I think we're. Nice talk. The micro droplet reactions, do you have that set up on the rapid fire or is it a separate workflow? No, that's an interesting question. So this was fully automated on a um, Agilent auto sampler and we have the Agilent jet stream source facilitating these reactions real time. So the rapid fire is also coupled to the 6545 XQTOF XT with the same source. But the issue with the rapid fire is there's no way to mix the streams, whereas you can do that on auto sampler. Oh, thank you again. Thank you. Uh,